Join me tonight on Twitch at 11.30 p.m. Eastern after the conclusion of Sunday Night Football, where we'll talk about everything that happened this week in the NFL. And join me Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern to play some live NFL trivia for a chance to win cash prizes. Link in the description below. And now, on with our feature presentation. When a player is disgruntled about his contract and is unhappy with the situation, often, that player will hold out. He won't report to the team, and won't play another snap until his contract situation is changed. We see this happen all the time. And there are countless of stories where the player and the front office are at odds with each other. Usually when a player holds out, the story ends one of two ways. The first is that the two sides come to a contractual agreement. Everything gets sorted out, whether it's long term or just a temporary fix, and both sides pretend as though nothing had ever happened. The second is that the team decides that the player isn't worth it, and the team dumps him, getting rid of what would be either a distraction or a locker room cancer. But in 1985, something bizarre with the New York Giants happened, because in 1985, the Giants did both of these things with wide receiver Ernest Gray. After Gray held out wanting more money, the Giants signed him to a new contract, only to cut him a few days later. The Giants, in that either-or situation mentioned a few seconds ago, found a way to make both of these happen, and even three and a half decades later, it's still confusing as to why this was the case. And this is the story behind the strangest contract holdout in New York Giants history. Before I talk about the situation at hand, we need some context to understand the player in question how good and instrumental he was in New York's offense, and why he wanted a new contract to begin with. Our story begins in 1979, when the Giants took the Memphis wide receiver in the second round of the NFL Draft. New York had a pretty porous passing attack in 1978 that ranked comfortably in the bottom half of the league in every major statistical passing category, and after the team drafted Phil Simms in the first round, the idea was to surround him with weapons and give him a strong cast of characters, or at the very least, a cast of characters where Jim Robinson was not his number one receiver anymore. The end result? Well, Gray was a very solid receiver for New York. For a team that was rather inept at the wide receiver position for much of the 1970s, Gray was a welcome change of pace. In 1979, Gray made an immediate impact by leading the Giants with 537 receiving yards on 19.2 yards per catch. If you looked at every receiver that year to have at least 25 receptions, 500 receiving yards, 4 touchdowns, and more than 19 yards per catch, the list would consist of Stanley Morgan, Harold Jackson, Lynn Swan, and Ernest Gray. That's it. Gray would have been the only receiver in the entire NFC to meet those criteria. And after a strong rookie season, Gray would only continue to get better and would continue to be one of the top options in the passing attack. In 1980, Gray had 52 receptions for 777 yards and 10 touchdowns. His 10 receiving touchdowns were the best in the NFC, and only trailed San Diego Chargers wide receiver Wes Chandler across the entire NFL. In fact, Gray became just the second receiver in Giants history at the time to have a season with 50 receptions and 10 touchdowns joining five-time Pro Bowler and all-1960s team member Del Schaffner in that category. Gray was in some pretty elite company to start his career off. He would continue to be a reliable receiver throughout the first half of the 1980s, and in 1983, he had his best year yet, when he recorded 78 receptions for 1,139 yards, setting a franchise record for most receptions in a single season, and finishing inside the top 10 across the entire NFL in both of these categories. Gray had proven himself to easily be the most reliable and dependable receiver that the Giants had in the post-merger era and the best since Homer Jones more than a decade and a half prior. And with that in mind, Gray had a message to the team. That message? Show me the money. The incident in question happened in 1985, but let's be very clear. The discontent between Gray and the Giants' front office had been brewing for quite some time. The writing was on the wall in 1984, when he was in the option year of a two-year contract that would have given him $110,000. Gray was not pleased with that, and wanted his contract extended, along with more money. After the season he had in 1983, where he set the single-season franchise record for receptions and was responsible for more than 27% of the receptions and 30% of the receiving yards that the team had that year, it's not hard to see why. Gray, upset about his entire situation, left training camp, which surprised head coach Bill Parcells, who said that he would be subjected to a fine of $1,000 for every day that he missed. Even general manager George Young was surprised by the news, saying he didn't tell me where he was going. However, this holdout was short-lived. Gray was only fined $1,000. Gray cracked very quickly, as one day later, he rejoined the team. Gray made it seem like he couldn't live without the game and couldn't live with himself holding out, saying, It's a little scary to think the skill you have always had will go away. I was nervous. Everything around seemed strange, like I missed something. He also made it very clear that he was still furious with the Giants, but that he came back for his teammates, he came back to send a message, and he came back because he spent one night in a hotel in New Jersey and was lonely, and that was enough for him. Gray played that 1984 season, and even though his production was slashed in half from that 1983 campaign, thanks in part to missing four games with a broken hand, he was still one of the top options on the team, and played a part in the Giants making it to the postseason. 
I talked about that almost improbable playoff run of theirs, so if you want to learn more about how that happened and how they snuck into the postseason, then click the card in the upper right corner. While Gray played the 1984 season, he made it very clear that in 1985, he wasn't playing unless he got a raise, and unless he got the contract that he desired. And Gray was holding firm. He was a free agent, but based on how free agency worked back in 1985, the Giants still held his rights. It wasn't really free agency, as Gray's options at the moment were to either play for New York or play for no one. And Gray chose the option of playing for no one. When training camp started in July, he didn't show up. When the preseason occurred in August, he wasn't there. Even when the regular season started in September and October, one of the best receivers in the history of the franchise, and arguably the best in the post-merger era at the time, was not in the giant blue. For all intents and purposes, he was holding out. And this holdout was about to have an extremely bizarre ending. Initially, Gray told the Giants that he was looking at over $1 million over a three-year period, or $350,000 a year. The Giants thought that this was too steep of a price to pay, and offered him somewhere in the ballpark of $290,000 to $300,000 per year. Now that doesn't seem like a huge difference, relatively speaking, especially since there was no salary cap back then, and even though the value of money back then was more than it is today due to inflation, and even though the NFL was not the machine printing billions of dollars a year like it is today, this still seems like a small difference. Still, the two sides could not come to an agreement, until Gray took that offer that the Giants made for three years and $900,000. And that's when the Giants decided to play hardball and rescind that offer. The Giants told Gray that he had his chance to take that agreement, he didn't, and now it was too late. Negotiations continued to stall until November, when halfway into the season, they finally reopened. Gray was staying at his home in Memphis, where he went to college while all this was going on, and he was staying in shape and working out daily, ready to play if needed. As he said, if I sign today, I feel like I could play Sunday, maybe just in third down situations. The coach might not feel that way. And finally, after a long dispute that was months and maybe even years in the making, the two sides came to an agreement. Gray would sign a two-year deal worth somewhere between $200,000 and $225,000 per year. It was way less than before, but remember that Gray missed the first half of the 1985 season, so on a per-game basis, it was still relatively equal. Just like that, Gray was back with the team, ready to play his seventh season. It was killing him that he wasn't able to be out there with his teammates while all of this was going down, with him saying during the negotiation, I watched two Giants games on television. It doesn't feel good at all. I'd rather be playing. Now on paper, it seemed like he was going to get that opportunity to do that, and he had a lot to look forward to that year. He was four receptions away from entering the top five all-time in Giants history in career receptions, and he was joining a team that had won three straight games and was 6-3 on the season, well in position to make it back to the postseason for the second straight season. So how did Gray perform for the Giants in 1985? Well, he didn't. There's one important rule change that we have to talk about that played a huge part in this. In 1982, the roster limit was set at 49 players. This meant that it was quite commonplace for teams to have the added flexibility with their roster construction. They could have helped younger guys, they could keep three quarterbacks or five receivers or multiple kickers. It made sense in theory. The more roster spots available, the more you can experiment. However, in 1985, this was cut back to 45 players. And Bill Parcells was adamantly against this rule change. He despised it, saying that players would become worn out in practice, saying that it forced rookies to be ready to go right away, and saying that you couldn't run certain formations. As he said, some teams deployed four wide receivers on some plays last season. How can you do that if you only have four wide receivers on your roster and one of them might be injured? While Parcells was definitely not the only coach against this rule, and while he was definitely not the only one impacted by this, we can't understate the impact that it had on the Giants and Ernest Gray, particularly with his roster spot. Under a 49-man roster, this isn't even a question. Gray makes it on, and the team can carry that extra receiver. But the Giants like where they were at with their receivers, and if it ain't broke, especially with a 6-3 record, why fix it? Lionel Manuel had a shockingly good 1984 season as a rookie, and was keeping up that strong play in 1985. Bobby Johnson was the same way, and he even had a 100-yard game earlier in 1985 against the Cowboys. Phil McConkey offered immense value on special teams alongside his receiving role, and Byron Williams was the team's primary blocking receiver, and it was very good at it. Putting Gray on this roster seemed like it was going to be trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. It almost would have been redundant. Parcell said that the plan for Gray was to practice him and see how he looked, but admittedly, Gray wasn't in the best of shape working out by himself in Memphis. By no means was he out of shape, but he wasn't in game shape yet, nor would anyone really be under those circumstances. And with the Giants making a playoff push and feeling comfortable with the receivers they had, the Giants decided to cut Gray. Two weeks after signing him to a multi-year extension and two weeks after settling the incredibly long holdout, the Giants got rid of him. Now that raises the obvious question of why they didn't just not sign him in the first place and not burn their money, 
if they always knew that this was the likely outcome. Regardless, Gray was now a free agent, hoping to catch on somewhere else. Unfortunately for him, that didn't happen. One day after he was weighed by the Giants, he was signed by the St. Louis Cardinals. The Cards knew about how good he was, having gone up against him twice a year in the NFC East, and they were hoping that he would give Neil Lomax another receiver to throw to, alongside an already solid cast of characters in Pat Tilly, Roy Green, and J.T. Smith, all three of whom were pro bowlers or would become pro bowlers at some point in their NFL careers. However, there's a reason that the Cardinals highlight you just saw a few seconds ago was the only footage of Gray in a Cardinals uniform, and that's because he barely got any playing time and did next to nothing. Gray played five games with the Cards, and he finished with three receptions for 22 yards and no touchdowns. It was an incredibly anticlimactic season for Gray. And after that 1985 season, Gray never played in the NFL again. In a matter of two years, he went from leading the NFC in receptions to being out of the league entirely. Something like that is incredibly bizarre. To go from the best receiver in the NFC to out of the league in that short of a time could be attributed to age, injuries, or off-the-field problems. Yet Gray's final season in 1985 came at just 28 years old, so he still had tons of time left on paper. He had no major injuries, as a broken hand in 1984 that sidelined him for a few games is in no way catastrophic enough to derail his career overnight like an ACL injury could, and he didn't have any suspensions or arrests or drug problems or anything along those lines. He just fell off the face of the earth after that contract negotiation. Ernest Gray has somewhat been forgotten in the history of the Giants, especially since in his aftermath, the Giants have won multiple Super Bowls and have had a ton of solid receivers. Gray was one of the first good receivers New York had since their days at Yankee Stadium, but since then, they've had a lot of guys who were productive like him, if not more so. However, nearly 35 years later, it's tough to forget how strange the end of his career was. To go from holding out to signing a multi-year contract and ending the feud, to getting cut, all in the span of about two weeks? It's tough to get a whole lot stranger than that. Get your official Jaguar Gary 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jrgator9, and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JJ9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See so how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.